Let's play some trivia. Chris, what cigar manufacturer was founded in 1895 and has roots in Cleveland, Ohio? Uh, <laughs> Jason Newman. That is correct. <laughs> Second question. Yeah. Which cigar manufacturer still produces cigars in their 112-year-old factory in Tampa, Florida? Jason Newman. Uh, correct again. Yep. All right, last one. Okay. Can you go three for three? Probably. Who are the creators of the Diamond Crown, Brick House, and the American Cigar? Uh, Jason Newman. That is right. Gosh, you know what? They say you look dumb, but you're pretty smart. Trivia is my thing. I like it. To explore everything J.C. Newman has to offer and a chance to win a free Diamond Crown whiskey set, visit jcnewman.com forward slash hot ticket. The whiskey set includes two Diamond Crown whiskey rocks glasses, whiskey rocks, and a set of tongs. All the hardware you need for a perfect drink. Again, enter a chance to win by visiting www.jcnewman.com forward slash hot ticket. All right, here we go. On to episode 234. Good to see you again. We're still alive. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. A couple whisker sours. Ooh. Put hair on my chest. They're pretty good though, aren't they? I've never understood that analogy. Puts yeah, or, hair on your chest. Or puts like hair on your balls or what? I think I think it just means you're a man now. Like this will make you a man. Yeah, but it's disingenuous to explain to a little boy who wants nothing but a full set of facial hair. Yeah. And chest hair to be manly. Yeah. And they're like, well, all you got to do is drink whiskey. <laughs> yeah. And then you become an alcoholic. And then you realize maybe just genetically you're not predisposed to getting facial hair because maybe you got some rosacea. Right. Or maybe oh, yeah, you're yeah. Indian, Native American. Oh, yeah. And then you're like, I don't know what that means. But where's my beard? Oh, because they can't grow facial they can't hair. Grow facial Dude, hair. how weird is that? It's pretty strange, isn't it? You know what I think is odd about that is like, Native Americans, you know, you, you know, correct people, me if I'm wrong, but the I, Europeans, the Europeans and the Spanish colonizers, the United States, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Personally, I'm sorry. Honestly, if you give it all back to the Native Americans, I would. It'd be so deserving. Dude, um, can you imagine the But US? what I think, it, what I think is strange is, is that there's pretty harsh climates in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I think about like, even like Inuits, like you think about like Eskimos and stuff. Yeah. They don't grow a lot of facial hair, but they're in the most like ridiculous climates in terms of like cold. You think which they'd be furry. You think they'd be furry as shit. Like us Polish people. Yeah. I mean, they have beautiful heads of hair. Have you yeah. ever seen a bald Indian? Nope. I don't think that exists. No. But facial hair? Doesn't exist. I've never seen it. Maybe it's really hard to eat <laughs> in the cold <laughs> climate with facial I guess hair. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe they have thicker skin. Blubber. Yeah. Well, they're not fat either though. That's true. You ever seen a fat Indian? And but, I don't mean Middle Eastern. I mean like Native American. I should say Native American. Do you Sorry. think people's skin is thicker in the harsher climates than it is in warmer? Probably. It is. Actually, there. I just read a thing where there was a study done talking about uh, colder climates and a part of um, natural evolution and folks that are that have like generations of family and yeah. are in colder climates typically throughout the year do have a higher BMI. I believe it. Totally. Yeah. Animals yeah. And, do. And to where it's actually more difficult for them to lose weight as a result of the climate of which they Animals in. do. We're an animal. Yeah. You know, it kind makes of interesting. sense. But then, uh, no, I guess, yeah, it does kind of make sense. It makes sense. Yeah. You ever seen a fat Brazilian? Nope. But I'm really just still I'm a little miffed on why any Inuits or Native Americans don't have facial <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating. It's a bit strange. It looks good though, because they. You know what I like about it though, like the fact that they don't grow facial hair, like they have such like such beautiful skin. Yeah, you know what I mean. True. And you just have like the most incredible jaw lines. It's maybe, like, why would you want to cover that? With maybe facial that's hair? God's answer for it. Like your fucking it's face. Like your this, face is great. The symmetry of your face is amazing. We're not masking it. We get hair because we look all fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> our beards correct our the lack of symmetry in our yeah. face. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of maybe an Adam and Eve thing. Like, like maybe us Western civilization people are just like the egotistical, vain people. And God's like, I'm going to make you all ugly. And then we're like, we got to look pretty. So we put on makeup. Yeah. And we try to look pretty. We we pluck our chin hairs when we're a female, you know? Yeah. It, maybe that's what it and is. And Native Americans, like, we have to do none of the above. Yeah, it's karma. 
Yeah, it's interesting. By the way, none of this is based in fact or science. I don't this know. This is bro science. I don't for know. Sure. <laughs> This is a hundred percent literal bro science. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to I don't I don't know if you were part of this particular text earlier. I actually think you probably were. Yeah, you were. One with John and Alex? Yeah. Somebody texts Alex and says, Is it me or does Corey look like Hulk Hogan did mounds of coke instead of roids? Mm. Who the fuck is that? I want to know who that is. I don't know. You're like Hulk Hogan's washed out brother that no one really knows about. Yeah. Except the family. Cuck, except the immediate family. Cuck Hogan. <laughs> cuck Hogan. <laughs> what a cuck. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to know who that is. I'm, I'm curious. I'm interested. Uh, it's got to be someone close. Yeah, I'm thinking it's Jesse. Could be. It's, it's got to. I figure it's just got to be Jesse. I'm I'm making an assumption. I don't know because he's got a clever sense of humor. It matches mine, and that's something I would say. Yeah. So I'm like, it's got to be him. Yeah. Um. Anyway, moving on. We're in episode 234. Uh, last week's episode 233. What a show that was! Holy shillelagh! I've spent the majority of my week literally answering messages and YouTube comments. Yeah. So it has been exhausting to say the least. The feedback has been. Really, really good. Very well received. You know, we said that uh, Chris and I both said that we're going to go into it as objective as possible, really just breaking down both the article and um, the response from Brian at uh, Pravada Cigar Club. And we did just that. I think we did it in a way that was fair and objective across the board. And I think the majority of the people appreciated that. We did have some Pravada defenders who I felt like (laughs) did not actually listen, listen to the episode or the watch comment. the episode. And I think they just automatically assumed they needed to come in defense of Pravada because we were um, supplying a bash fest, which was not the case. Um, so, you know, everybody has their opinions about <clears throat> the information that is produced. I, I always, I, what I related to is like politics, which is an extreme sense of tribalism. Football teams. And football teams, I think there's that aspect to this a little bit um, because of this uh, group that has been created. Uh, call them the, what are they called? Someone called them the Providians. You know, they're the, the <laughs> Providians. Like, yeah, the Providians, which I thought was really that funny. That sounds awesome, actually. Yeah, it actually does sound pretty dope. Um, and, and, and I get it. Like, you know, it's, it's, that's your tribe you're going to defend. But, you know, my wish was uh, you actually listened to and understood the context of which is being provided throughout the episode. So you know that that wasn't our intention. That wasn't our focus. That's not what we wanted to do. And and there was a few people I had to like kind of explain that to and say, hey, listen, this is what we did. I encourage you to listen to the episode. Yeah. And they actually responded back. Oh, yeah. Like that totally makes sense. I, I get what you're saying. Also, I understand both sides of it. I get it. So on. So I think it was super well received. It's been a, a pretty big episode for us thus far, which I, I assumed it was just given the topic, um, just the nature of the topic as a whole. Things have happened since then, and, and what I want to say is I don't want to I don't want to continue this thing forward. We have plenty to talk about. I literally have mapped out like the next ten weeks of podcasts, and I've had to put certain things on hold because of this, and because of this podcast that we're going to be doing today. So we just want to move forward. Um, if anything big kind of breaks or whatever, we'll address it as it as it comes forward. But you know that that episode was something that. We felt needed to happen because it was super current. Like it was happening literally the day before and that day was the majority of the news that came out on all this stuff. Um, and there'll be some topics that are related to this. Like one of the things we're talking about today is loosely connected to that. And and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's it was uh, super well received. I appreciate, li- I mean, all the fucking people who commented, all the people who took the time to send a message, all the people who asked questions. There's a lot of comments on those posts. A lot of comments, dude. The DMs were insane. I spent, I've spent the last three days. It's calmed down today, being Thursday. Yeah. But dude, I spent the first three days of the week like doing nothing but answering DMs. Yes. All yeah. day and all night. So I, I think the purpose of this is clear. What we wanted to accomplish is to bring you solid information from both sides so that you can go out and vote at the next election. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yep, this is a political thing, <laughs> no doubt. Um, that being said, uh, so one of the things that occurred today, um, which I think is very, very important to the industry, and again, and this is what I mean by loosely related, the National Academy of Science releases a report on premium cigars. So 
uh, I actually had the opportunity to, and this is current. This was today at 11 p.m. or 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Thursday, what is it? Uh, September March 10th. 10th. March 10th. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> why did I say September? I don't I have no idea. Uh, March 10th, uh, 11, 11, <laughs> 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I got a chance to sit through the webinar. So there's a report that was created by this committee, uh, by these researchers on premium cigars as a whole. You can access the report. Half Wheel has it on their site. I'm going to put the link to the report in this video so you guys have it at your fingertips if you want to read through it. I got a chance to sit on the webinar. So the folks who are in charge of actually doing the research and the reports, there's I think six people on the panel today, actually got a chance to speak and divulge a little bit more about their findings in terms of report. So it was broken out into four categories. Product characteristics, which was really just defining, okay, what is a premium cigar? Patterns of use. Patterns of use included who's smoking them, where they're smoking them, and so on. And then there's the marketing and perceptions. This is what's loosely related to the topic of which we talked about last week. I will get into specifics on that and why I think the study today is is somewhat irrelevant to what we were talking about last week. And of course, the health effects. Um, I will say this as a whole before I get into uh, uh, more of a deep dive in each one of these. My conclusion that I drew from being on the webinar is there's a ton more research and work that needs to be done before anybody comes to any conclusion about anything. I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go into more details on that. So product characteristics, this is something that was covered, I would say, in a brief portion of the webinar. And that really was kind of centered around what is a premium cigar, definitionally. By the way, the FDA has not clearly defined what a premium cigar is yet. You know, this spans back to 1998 when when the FDA started to mm. regulate premium tobacco, there still isn't a solid definition. And this research group has not provided a solid definition yet of what a premium cigar is because part of it is the loose characterization of, okay, premium tobacco is one thing, but there's variants of cigars. You have cigarellos, you have sweetened tips, you have infused, you have all these things. And a, a, a full definition hasn't been created. Question. Yeah. <clears throat> For someone who was not on the uh, uh, webinar, mm -hmm. um, when I think of premium, I think of two things, price accessibility and accessibility of the product overall. Yeah. Were any of those mentioned? Price was mentioned as something that they did not consider. Okay. Yeah. Which is important. It's an important topic to discuss, as mm -hmm. we've said before, because it's not so much, okay, the price per what, but it is the relation of who can actually afford right. a cigar, right. which is a question I asked and the three questions that I asked <laughs> they that asked they it. never addressed. They never answered <laughs> They <it>. never answered. <laughs> um, so yes, price was actually something that is in the report that they said they did not consider as a part of their research. Okay. Um, so moving on, patterns of use. So this is one that they stuck on for a little <laughs> while. And this all centered around, okay, historically, what has been the increase of usage on cigars? Where are cigars smoked most often? They were talking about the imports of cigars, so how many cigars were imported into the United States, which, which essentially means if there's 400 million cigars imported in the United States, it means 400 million were consumed. That's the, the distinction that they made, was it was kind of a one-for-one -one thing. Oh, that's grossly inaccurate. Um, which is a bit <laughs> inaccurate. Well, one... one precedes the other and the other one lags behind the other yeah yeah for sure so i mean all in all i think closely connected enough i was hoping they were going to talk about like tracking us like herds of buffalo yeah or like those yellowstone wolves yeah that like affected the ecosystem for all the that'd be funny <laughs> i was hoping it was that granular <laughs> no i mean this is where they this is kind of where they talked a little bit more about the usage among youth Mm -hmm. which, by the way, they even admitted in the webinar and it's in the research, um, the insignificance of youth usage of premium cigars. Of course. Yeah. It's such a minute amount. Now, they didn't draw any conclusions as to why. They only researched. I really want people to understand that their whole job was to do preliminary research around this topic. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to come to any sort of basis or conclusion about what these things were. So don't think of like, we're... 
I think the cigar community as a whole gets a little frustrated when it comes to this because we all look at it and go, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. It's like a common sense We thing. already fucking know that. Yeah. But their job isn't to know that yet. Their job is only to um, draw, okay, based on their research, here's what they have. Here's evidence <laughs> to support certain things. <laughs> Just, they just took a group of t- they took a group of college students. Hey kids. <laughs> and they brought them into a lab, just one single college student at a time. And they set them at a table. And there's a pack, a 24 pack of natty light and one cigar sitting on the table. Choose like, one. Which one would you choose? I'm like, of course I'll take the natty light. <laughs> yeah, of course. I can share this with my buddies and we're all gonna get <laughs> fucked up. It's like, mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. That's the kind of research they should do. Um, so obviously, patterns of use uh, was directly related to children. And then they went on to the third topic, which marketing and perceptions. Now, I was under the impression that they were really going to talk about marketing cigars to children specifically as it relates to articles that we discussed last week. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily the case. Um, it, they never said children. They said youth, which I think youth is a... 18 uh, and up? Is a much larger spectrum of age than children. Mm-hmm. Like we define children as younger than teenagers. Right. Youth could be anywhere from early on, uh, I think it's straight out of the womb to maybe 18, even 17, 18 13 years old. 13 to 16 feels youthful. Yeah, it does. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the proper definitions are, but they never really said children. They never said kids. They just said youth. That was the terminology that they used throughout uh, the webinar. Now, one of the things that they mentioned, which I had some dispute with, was, okay, well, a lot of cigar advertisement that is being done and marketed is done through luxury lifestyle magazines. That is true. But this is this is the correlation that I make because this goes back to mm. something that they didn't want to talk about, which was the price association of cigars. So I'll use this for an example. Um, luxury lifestyle ag- advertisement. Yes, you can... Uh, put cigar advertisements in lux- luxury lifestyle magazines, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think about is like, you can also put an advertisement for a Rolls Royce in a luxury lifestyle magazine. A teenager, a kid's going to go, wow, I really wish I had that Rolls Royce. But guess what? They don't have the means and they don't have the expendable income Dude. to buy a Rolls Royce. <laughs> so I think the same is true for cigars. Now that's obviously a big spectrum. That's And, and I'm using an exaggerated example but just because some kid sees it in a GQ magazine advertisement doesn't mean it's, it's appetizing not. to a child. It's not. Which, which, again, they're only uncovering elementary aspects through this research project and yeah. not really necessarily making the correlation or the connection to the things that we already understand and know as common sense. Can I, can I give a, a general observation on experience on this? Sure. If they're looking at actual traditional advertising as it pertains to cigars in the industry and how it influences people, that is probably, at this time, culturally speaking, the least effective. You know what the number one effective way for someone to be influenced to smoke a cigar? Peer pressure. Peers. Yeah. Peers. Yeah. It's going to be your friends. It's going to be your fathers. Right. It's going to be people you're hanging out with. That is the number one way that if you talk to any cigar smoker, that's almost always how they get into cigars. Right. My friend does it. We're golfing on the weekends. It's not and then ads. I really started to love this thing. Sir Dirk Dirk Dirk. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to go back to, um, actually, no, I don't, because we're going to talk about health effects next, which is loosely related to patterns of use uh, and the way that they correlated it in the webinar. Um, so yeah, so they were talking about like marketing at festivals and they actually had like a logo of Drew Estate, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and one of the things that I think they need to do a better job of as they continue their research is understanding what are those festivals? Are those 21 and up festivals? They never clearly define that because Drew Estate has like their barn burner stuff and they do like DJ stuff and they sponsor those things. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no accessibility to anybody under the age of 21 at those events. So I look at that and say, okay, well, give us more detail. What do you mean festivals? You're saying it as like this blanket thing, but you don't have any definitive <laughs> answers or proof in terms of what is the accessibility of those environments Coachella. to children. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example. Like you can't go to Coachella, Coachella if you're under 18, right? Or 21. I don't think so. So like th- that's kind of my point is like you may have these sponsorships that go into effect for – uh, certain festival-like environments. And they, you really, they stuck on the festival thing a lot, which I was like, are you grasping for straws at this one because you have nothing well, else to connect to? There's only two things people are concerned about at festivals, and that's fucking and drinking. 
And acid. And acid. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, they ain't worried about cigars. Cigars ain't in there. I'm telling you right now. (laughs) Like some sweaty ass fucking girl, like smells like a pig pen. It's like in the middle of some fucking frantic acid trips going, you know what sounds good right now? You know how many videos I've seen (laughs) of people banging at a Coachella and like behind a dumpster and they're like getting filmed by someone with a camera phone. They're like in a mud pit. They're like, don't stop. Yeah. But yeah. they're still doing it because they don't give a fuck. Her face is smashed up against a porter, John. The only thing people care about at a Coachella is fucking sex and fucking liquor. And then some drugs. Yeah. Some opioids. <laughs> yeah, definitely not concerned cigars, about cigars. Absolutely not. Yeah, so there's like, I think there's some things where like they were really trying to create the connection between like the youth aspect, which I think they could have went harder on other things and they didn't. Like the things that I thought they were going to say, hey, this is an exciting example of this and blah, blah, blah. They never went down that path. And I think their research was um, not conducted in a way that I think benefited them as a whole. Um, last but not least, we'll go into health effects. This is something that irritated me a little bit. And this is one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, three questions that I asked as well was specifically around in the way that they define the characteristics of cigar did not provide any disparity between that of a cigarette and a cigar. They're basically saying the health implications are exactly the same. What they failed to mention in this was, and someone asked this question, which they kind of skirted around, was the chemical additives to cigarettes, specifically if you're smoking a cigarette via inhalation. Mm -hmm. So there's two factors that I think are very important for people to understand. When it comes to comparison of a cigar and a cigarette, I'm not saying cigars aren't addictive. That's what they were really attacking was the nicotine content of cigars Uh, and their addictive properties, but not necessarily the health implications past nicotine. Now, by the way, just to be clear on this, nicotine has very few negative impacts. It can potentially raise your blood pressure. Makes me focus. And it raises your adrenaline. It's like Which creates focus, right? There's a lot of people who smoke cigarettes before they do, sh- mm-hmm. you know, they perform a show. There's a lot uh-huh. of people uh, that smoke cigarettes before they do stand up. There is yeah. a sense of adrenaline. There's that. So, there's so, a little bit of a nicotine rush. They call it a nicotine there's rush. There's a for calming a effect too that they used to they used to prescribe cigarettes to soldiers in the military. Yeah, in it's World like War a focus II. effect. Like yeah. it's it, it keeps you even keel, but keeps you the eye on the prize, right? So they call they literally call it like. Hey, I get this nicotine rush, right? Mm-hmm. So they stuck on that as a per, uh, uh, a particular addictive pr- uh, byproduct of smoking cigars. What they didn't do was they didn't create a close connection, or they didn't create a, a connection between what are the actual health implications from carcinogens. The reality is, and this wasn't discussed really to a great depth or detail within the webinar, was cigarettes are typically inhaled to the lungs. To the lungs mm-hmm. and also have chemical additives. Mm-hmm. Neither one of those is true with cigars. Correct. Neither one of those exists with cigars. There are no chem- there are no chemical additives, and what we would what we would define as premium tobacco or premium cigars and minimal inhalation. But for most people, it's nil. Right. And the people who typically inhale cigars are previous cigarette smokers. <laughs> I wish they would have just said it like just as plain, straight one hundred and one. It's like, well, the way we conducted the health effects of tobacco with the human biology is we asked this simple question. Can it be eaten without having any negative implications? <laughs> and we had one of our test subjects actually consume tobacco and he vomited immediately. For science. Based on our tests, it is conclusive that tobacco is unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Yeah, I could use you as a cited example. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's essentially as far as they went with health effects, also citing that more research needed to be done. Um, one of the other things I thought was interesting, which really didn't kind of land in any one of these categories was, uh, the potential impact of secondhand smoke. Now Mm. here's, I think here's the reality around cigars. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say traditionally back from the early 1900s through probably the 1980s, 1990s, actually specifically the 1990s, it wasn't uncommon to have a smoking household, meaning that cigarettes are being consumed in a household of multiple people. Sure. Right? That is very uncommon these days. Most of the time, if you have someone who smokes in a household, they smoke outside the household. Mm-hmm. Now, let me, let me explain to you what I feel is more common with cigars. 
cigars are typically never consumed in a household unless there's proper ventilation. Part of that has to do with how pungent and how thick cigar smoke is. Yes. And how if there's anything porous within your house, it's going to consume that cigar smoke and linger literally forever. So cigar smoke as a smell specifically is a turnoff from being able to smoke. I don't smoke in my house, right? I smoke in the garage or I smoke outside. So I think the potential implication of secondhand smoke, specifically as it relates to in the household, is probably very nominal. Now, the other consideration that they talked about was how many people are consuming cigars in lounges, to which I said, that doesn't even fucking matter because if you're in a lounge, you're smoking a cigar and secondhand smoke doesn't make a it's, fucking difference it's anyway. It's secondary to how much you're in, you're putting in your mouth anyway. Doesn't make a difference. No. It doesn't zero. make a difference. Makes and by zero. the way, just in Most case, of them. just in case you feel that somebody is going to a cigar lounge with not the intention to smoke. Most cigar lounges have adequate ventilation Correct. and ones now have even more than adequate ventilation Correct. to make sure that any sort of lingering smoke is consumed by some sort of ventilation. System. Dude, on an average, I want to say if there is a lounge in a cigar shop, they likely, likely, I'm not saying always, I'm not saying there isn't exceptions, but there is likely better ventilation in a cigar lounge than in a fucking restaurant. Oh, for sure. I've been in restaurants that smell like giant grease traps. <laughs> yeah. Because they can't get the goddamn grease out right. of the fucking so, out of the goddamn building. So now there are exceptions, and there's one that starts with a W that comes to mind. What is that? <laughs> by, by the mall, Fairfield. By the Fairfield Mall. Yeah, starts with oh. a W. <laughs> Cigar Lounge. Yeah. Those smoke eaters yeah, haven't like worked I said, in years. <laughs> there are some exceptions. Don't get me wrong. There's birds dying in there. But I'm just most kidding. people, especially like BG cigar, B&G Cigar Lounge, which is a love of mine. And it they is have glorious. an incredible reduction system for, and as far they as ventilation. Put a it is insane. They fucking legit system in there. And when there's, when there's a- It's worth like 50 grand. When there's 80 people in there with the ventilation that they have in even the private lounge that they're expanding through the entire facility- Dude, you can hardly fucking notice anything. Yeah, it's pretty in, it's pretty insane. Their ventilation system's awesome. Um, well, let me get in the conclusion because we have just a couple more minutes before I have to take a break. Um, conclusion of what I see in this, and even the conclusion as it um as the panel suggested, is just way too much research to be done. Here's what I'll say. Hire us. All this research is to be done for the FDA. Mm. and how they're going to proceed and getting a better understanding of uh, the implications, health implications of premium tobacco. It became very clear to me very quickly that they just don't know enough. They haven't done enough research. They haven't even defined what premium cigars and premium tobacco is. There is no solid definition of what that means in accordance to the FDA. In addition to that, there is not enough surveys that have been done to understand some of the things that we've discussed topically here. Like, do you smoke in cigar lounges or do you smoke at home? How many cigars are you smoking today? Do you inhale cigars? There isn't enough data to suggest that there's anything harmful about cigars at this point simply because there's just not enough information out there via these resources. We understand it as somebody who consumes cigars every day. Yeah. We know what that is, but no one's going to listen to us. You're not going to hire us for research. We're biased. Do you know? No. Here's the thing. And that's why I will say I kind of agree. I disagree with that. The problem is, is there's a lot of it so-called experts that do research around people without actually getting into the weeds without actually filling the shoes right like when they do scientific studies on pro athletes they don't just ask coaches they fucking bring in an athlete to understand the physical implications of what it's like to be a pro athlete no i'm not saying that it shouldn't be done what i'm saying is it won't be done oh i know i know you know what i mean that's true yeah that's true. And I, and I would say, but if they want the most accurate information, if they really want to understand the implications of what it's like to be a cigar smoker and its health impacts, its marketing influences, whatever, it has to be from a cigar smoker. Yeah. It has to be. Or it has to be from a lot of cigar smokers. But it can't be on the periphery. Right. You know, it can't be this like six degrees of bacon where you're trying to... <laughs> <laughs> trying right. to understand something without that any intimate knowledge right. of what it's like to be that person. Right. Then you're just making assumptions. 
I think a lot of what even was, as far as the data is presented today, was loosely connecting some assumptions, but what the reality is, there's simply just not enough out there to make suggestions around anything. Meaning that there's so much work to be done, and I'm gonna end with this because we gotta take a break. Sure. I highly suspect that the FDA, that any of this that we're talking about now is on their radar literally at all. I was uh, messaging back and forth with Rich today and Rich, and Rich was going, <laughs> I was like, yeah, what, what it reminds me of is like anybody at higher up in the FDA that makes somebody, let's say I was like, Karen, I use the example of like Karen and Bill. I was like, like, Hey, Karen and Bill, you're on, you're on premium cigars today was only because they got punished for something else <laughs> because, it's- because they fucked up the opi- opioid, uh, crisis that existed. Like, if you get that assignment, it's because you're the bottom of the it's fucking like you're barrel. It's like a junior editorial at a fucking newspaper. That's what it is. That's literally what it is. I, I think the FDA doesn't give a... F- I don't think they give two fucks about any of this shit. So that's yeah. my ultimate conclusion. What we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back at you guys in just a minute. Hang tight. You know, I'm getting to the point now. My age, my health, the fact that you know, I've become, I, I've gotten all this social anxiety that I don't even want to leave my house anymore. The thing is, like, I still want to smoke cigars at home, but I sure as shit do not want to leave my home. Yeah, well, you're perpetually sick, so there's I'm a societal sick. responsibility that you have as well. I just wish there was, like, some way for me to, like, buy cigars without having to think about it. I think I have the medicine for you. Mm. My cigar pack. Curated packs come straight to your door every single month. Is it five pack of cigars, specially handpicked for you? And you can also subscribe to the Factory Direct program and get cigars that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, as long as it covers the Omnicom variant, I'm good. <laughs> I heard they show up in hazmat suits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to make sure that safety and protection are at top of mind. That's so good. you can visit my cigar pack www.mycigarpack.com to support all their options. Again, that's www mycigarpack.com oh! <laughs> oh! 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 I, I can't believe it a polar bear and a whale together what about the penguin though <laughs> fucking crazy what a drug addict <laughs> alright we're back um, second part of the show is going to be another interesting topic I'm sorry to get so serious on everyone. I actually said yesterday, I'm like, I want to have a lot more fun with this episode because I didn't really have fun with the last one because it was so serious. It was very serious. Like we had one. So the one funny thing that we talked about, I clipped out. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> which, was, which was us talking about the government just going around fucking pickpocketing people panhandling. or panhandling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's I was like, okay. that's the only fucking funny part of the episode. Yeah, it was a very serious episode. Um. But yeah, so I wanted to talk about in the second half of this episode, um, which I think is a very crucial thing that I think people don't understand right now. Um, so it's cigars that relates to social media and the decline of cigars and social media as a whole. So one of the things I've noticed, and I've noticed this as a trend over the past probably month and a half, two months, is that content related to cigars, specifically if you have a large Instagram following or a big profile, um, is being stifled to a very high degree, meaning that Instagram is choosing not to push the content. So there is no exposure via hashtags. There's no exposure via the explore pages. And the reason I, I'm beginning to understand that it's larger profiles with a bigger following is because I've talked to other folks within the cigar industry, about six so far, that are all experiencing the same issues and challenges in terms of um, getting their content out to the masses. And so The point I'm trying to make here is like a lot of people are on Instagram specifically just to, hey, here's a picture of the cigar. Here's them smoking. There's a sense of a community, but it's not it's not super connected, but it's just like, here's this thing and here's what I like. Most of the time when people enter into Instagram, there's a thought behind it. It's like I'm doing reviews and there's an association with this business aspect of what I'm doing, which is what we do. There's sponsorship. There's the influence piece of it. Sometimes people just like to be like, hey, this is what I'm fucking smoking. Here's what's out there. But all of it's done with some sort of intentionality. Um, What I'm starting to see more and more is that cigar related content, premium tobacco content as a whole is just being completely shut off by Instagram. And I'm saying Instagram specifically, but Instagram is also related to Facebook. Facebook's doing the same exact thing. So I think this is a challenge for the cigar community as a whole because I think 
I can make an assumption that Instagram is probably the biggest platform for interaction around cigars that exists. Mm -hmm. I think at one time it was like individual blogs, then it kind of became subreddits um, in terms of the community aspect. And then it was Facebook via the groups. And I think that has been on a substantial decline in the past few years. More often than not, I hear people say, I'm on Instagram. But I don't see them on Facebook and I don't see them on TikTok and I don't see them on these other platforms. Instagram seems to be the one in which people occupy the most in terms of their time. Um, and I think it's because I can post a picture, put it out there. Here's a small caption and people are going to go, ooh, look at that. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, we're on Instagram for the podcast specifically for promotion around the podcast. And for no other reason. Well, there's also... I want to uh, speaking specifically about the hot ticket pod. There's the personability behind the show as well. Right. There's like, there's the personality. What I'm saying is if the podcast didn't exist, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing on gotcha. social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously there's aspects to it. Like, you know, I used the example earlier. I'm responding to a hundred messages. Somebody messages me. They never go unanswered ever. And sometimes it's really hard to keep up with. So that's the community aspect that I feel that Instagram provides. Although again, somewhat disconnected. Um, is still something that is substantial and you can't dispute how substantial it has been over the course of like the past five to seven years. So I think about in my head the potential impacts, negative impacts that this could have on the cigar community as a whole. There's already sort of this weird divisiveness in the cigar community and people have their own thoughts as far as like the progression and evolution. And I think the pandemic has accelerated some of that to a degree. And I look at it and go, okay, so if not Instagram, let's just say this trend continues and uh, fresh content is not getting to where it needs to go. I use us as an example because this is something that I live, eat, and breathe every day. If I'm pushing something out as far as content, trying to promote the podcast, I'm not only promoting the podcast to anybody who potentially already listens to the podcast or follows us, but I'm trying to gain access into the folks who don't follow us. There's an intentionality around growth in terms of what we do. Within the community. Within the community, specifically. Right. What is being challenged now is, and I just showed Chris some statistical data, I showed him two different posts, one from January 4th and one that I posted today. The one from January 4th, if I look at the extended reach through Instagram, which they'll give me analytics and statistics as far as how many impressions that this particular post had, it was substantial. It was more substantial in the category of unfollowers than it was followers. Mm -hmm. I think it was what, 3,000 something followers saw the post and something like 13 to 14,000 non-followers saw the post. In a very, uh, I would say, related image that I posted today, which I knew historically, if not for this stifledness by Instagram, would have certainly gotten a ton of attention uh, because here's the here's the reality. People like I know lineups. <laughs> I know how Instagram works. I know I can tell you definitively what content I post was going to get what kind of attention. Literally, almost like to the thousand. Like I can tell you exactly how much attention it'll get. This one today that I showed Chris, statistically looking at the analytics, had a unfollowers push of what five. I think it was five percent the or five, five followers or fifteen followers or something or fifteen unfollowers. Yeah. So a complete reversal of what it was like before, and this is happening across the board. And I suspect right now this is really only happening to some of the big, uh, the big cigar Instagrams. Anybody who's probably got ten thousand followers or more, fifteen thousand followers or more, I know all those accounts. I'm very familiar with who they are, and. And when I go to, if I just look up a hashtag, let's say I look up hashtag cigar or cigars, which are the two most popular. If I look up the results of those hashtags, I see none of those people. Zero. None of them exist. In the top, they may show up in recents, but they don't show up in top posts. They're gone. They're literally fucking, they vanished, so including us. So basically what he's saying is, is if you, like me, <clears throat> who's what we call stalkers, on social media. We don't post, but we definitely consume. Yeah. Um, that is you for sure. We will follow hashtags, <clears throat> right? We will right. follow hashtags. Right. Uh, we'll follow accounts, but we follow hashtags because it gives us the best variety of content. Yeah, I follow, I think there's like 15 or 16 different yeah. hashtags that I follow. It gives us the best variety of content outside of people we want to follow because we don't want to follow a 
fucking 5,000 people. It's stupid. I'm like, we, But we want to consume the content. Right. So we'll follow hashtags. What he's saying is, is that if you follow those hashtags, I won't see Hot Ticket. Yeah, we will not show up. I won't see him as recently posted based on this hashtag. And if I go to Discovery, which is based on my search findings or things I typically look at, I still won't see him. Right. That is correct. So then basically it looks like Hot Ticket ain't posting shit. And then, you know, I'm going to continue to never see it. I'm like, well, I thought Hot Ticket's not doing shit unless I literally go to their profile. You'd have to go to their profile and then like tap notifications. Yeah. Yeah. So that way, anytime we post something, it gets looked at. Um, so that's the reality of Instagram. And I can cont- I think we'll continue to see this decline even as uh, smaller profiles. I think I think it's kind of a first wave thing at this point where I think it's like targeted specifically to larger profiles around premium tobacco. And I think the trickle down effect will certainly make its way to folks that are would have a couple thousand, down to a thousand, a couple hundred. And before you know it, anybody who's posting cigar related content, unless you're following a specific person, you're likely not going to see anything outside of that. I just think of any small media organization of people oh yeah in the industry are gonna fucking hate trying to grow their content it's been tough for us and And you have to you have to be very creative as far as what you do i mean you have to be you have to be insanely creative fucking hate it yeah so so that being said there's obviously the in relation to that of facebook because they're both the same organization we're seeing some of that there anyway although i think facebook has uh, lost relevance over a period of time unless you're fucking 65 years and older and you're fucking retired and you're sitting at your home fucking piddling your putt all day you're probably you know you're not looking at cigar community stuff on facebook and if you are you're just probably part of a group that is just trying to fucking trade cigars back and forth and no one gives a shit <laughs> um i said i already said the reddit that completely filled with trolls and reddit it's, has, toxic. it's super toxic that's a thing of the past so i think even subreddits in terms of cigars are pretty much just troll based um so no significance there the other one that really kind of striked me as um w- a little bit shocking was tiktok and actually so you know kevin from cigar Proc, uh, as is kevin from cigar hey, Proc, yeah. um he actually sent me a message and he goes hey he sent me a message on tiktok and said hey just fyi so you um so you know what the new tiktok guidelines are and he sent me this thing and I looked at it and I go, oh shit, they are specifically targeting cigars and premium tobacco. Meaning that if there is, and if you look at his content right now, I will challenge anybody who follows him or look at his most recent content. Tell me if you find any content of him smoking a cigar. It does not exist. Since that, he has not posted any, any content because he has a big following on TikTok. It's pretty massive. Um, but he shoots a lot of videos related to cigars, but not of him smoking cigars. Can, is he showing the cigar? Uh, there's times where he'll show a cigar, but he's not smoking it because they're specifically talking targeting people smoking cigars. Okay. Now, for me, I keep smoking them and I keep posting on TikTok. I'm doing like really short. By the way, if you are on TikTok and you're not following us, go follow us. I'm doing like one minute reviews that are exclusive to TikTok. Like I'm not posting them to Instagram. I'm just doing them on TikTok and they're just like one minute, like quick little blurbs about what I'm thinking about the cigar in the moment. Mm -hmm. And some of them get, are getting a ton of fucking attention. But now that, now that uh, TikTok has announced that they are going to limit that particular content of smoking cigars, I assume as time goes on that my videos will probably get less and less attention. That's okay. I'll keep posting them because it's kind of, it's kind of fun. I like doing short, quick stuff that I can just do like, you know, snappy. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like even TikTok, and I, I th- I'm part of this goes to like, it's just these platforms are fucking too woke. They're too woke. It, if it's this thing, it's going to be this thing next. It's going to be this thing next. It's you know, I got, I, I got fucking in trouble because Pete Johnson put out a post. That's why he put put out a post one time, and I made a comment that said something about somebody being a dumb dumb. I was like, hey, stop being. I literally, I think I said, stop being a stupid dumb dumb face. I got fu- I got fucking in trouble. My comment got removed because it was hate speech. I was like, what the fuck is going on? So we live in these woke times. And by the way, if you woke, you hate cigars. Period. This is like enemy number one. Because cigars are consumed, according to the research in which I went through today, are consumed by old, rich, white guys. And there's no better opportunity to be woke if, unless it's, if it's against an old rich white guy, 
you woke. Like, and that's that's kind of what I'm seeing with these social media platforms, TikTok specifically, Instagram, is that they're creating these rules and they are they are stifling. I mean, they are literally limiting and controlling every bit of content that can possibly consume. I really think that there's going to be a time in which unless something isn't 100% completely buttoned up, you're not going to be able to post it. Can like, I? it's going to be so fucking limited. I've already seen the guidelines for Instagram. I've read through the guidelines of TikTok. Dude, it's like reading through, it's like reading through a fucking college dissertation. I'm like, why are there 40 pages of shit? Like, the, the rule should be, don't be a fuckhead. Don't treat other people like shit. Otherwise, put out your stuff. That should be the fucking limit. And if it has to go beyond that, what are we doing? Like, it's fucking crazy. The whole thing just fucking irritates me. The things people say and do to us hold no meaning unless we give it meaning. Thank you, Morgan Freeman. I know that sounds ridiculous. I heard that in a Morgan Freeman voice when you said it. Sorry. (laughs) I know that sounds ridiculous. But people can say the slightest thing with the best intentions and still offend someone. Yeah, true. And the only reason it's offensive is because you reacted Offen- in a way I know that, made, it that made you feel offense offensed by it, right? Right. I am so sick of the fucking cancel culture bullshit. Well, that's what's going on now. I am so sick of it. And I know it's hard not to have butthurt feelings over people that criticize you and say things that get under your skin. But I'm telling you this right now, and I try to live by this code as well even though shit gets under my skin every once in a while dude don't let it fucking take you over the one thing you have fucking control over in this world is your fucking self that's true and your feelings you control your feelings you control how you respond right if you let that shit get to you that's your own fucking fault too many safe spaces out there too do you know what i'm saying too it's many fucking pussies. annoying. We're, we've bred, we've bred an entire society of a bunch of fucking pussies. It fucking annoys me, and I'm not. Listen, we say some off color shit on this show, right? And we point the finger at ourselves a lot. You made fun of Native Americans earlier. I did, and if people come at me, I get it. Listen. I don't get it. It's a joke. Don't fucking come at us. It's a goddamn. I'm joke. just saying, like, it wasn't even beyond that. You're either gonna find it offensive or you're not. Yeah, you're either going to know my intent or you're not, but right. I understand that it's going to offend some people and it's not going to offend others. Right. And then you're going to, you're going to come back in comments and whether it's on the social media or some other way, it doesn't matter, but it fucking annoys me. Yeah. And it's happening. It happens all too often too. Like, it dude, there's fucking like fucking annoys me. fucking keyboard warriors, the God fucking the woke fucking people of the world. Like I just imagine there's just a fucking gaggle of people at Instagram who are just going through looking like, oh, I'm on cigars I today. Have no doubt. And they're just fucking power hungry to stop anything that they fucking don't believe or have yeah. disbelief for. And they're just looking at them like, oh, this profile, this guy called this guy a dumb, dumb, stupid face. <laughs> Report him and block my profile. I mean, literally, I can't tell you how many times. It's like, <laughs> I know when I'm shadow banned. I know when it's coming. I'm like, I, and I've told people this before, like, <laughs> you know, if I'm like posting a cigar, like, you know, I've had manufacturers that say, hey, are you going to do a cigar review on, uh, hey, are you going to do a cigar review on this cigar or whatever? Like, yeah, I had this lined up and, and you know, we push a lot of things, social media. This week's not a good week because <laughs> it's not going to go very far. <laughs> so I have to wait. I push my shitty content during times of quarantine. And I mean, social media quarantine. <laughs> and then as soon as I'm fucking released out of solitary confinement, then I go and put out the good premium content. <laughs> so I hate to tell you for the next week, probably I'm going to be pushing out a bunch of garbage. <laughs> so that's what you're going to get. Um it's actually why I ended up pushing the giveaway because the giveaways inherently garner a lot of attention because just Good the over bad. amount of people that uh, that just tag other people. Yeah. Um, so you can. T- I was like, wow, it's the best week ever to do a giveaway. <laughs> True. Um, which, by the way, thank you for everybody who's entered the giveaway. It has been a ton of fucking people. Holy shit, dude! Did you see how many comments there were between both posts? I I admire it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna it's insane. I'm gonna make one comment, and I'm gonna, I'm calling out a lot of people that might listen to this show. Do it, tagging me 
to enter the contest is a fucking cop out. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Well, I don't see that anyway. And you're don't not. Don't fucking tag me in your goddamn entries. That's a goddamn <laughs> cop out, and I'm sick of seeing them. <laughs> what's inter- What's interesting about it is that. Like you're not keeping track of anything, so it doesn't no. know any. They're just tagging it. Oh, I see what you're saying. They're using you're me as the, the entry. Second, you're the second entry tag. Yes, that's hilarious. Stop fucking tagging me in the fucking <laughs> entries, dude. I'm gonna go back through you fuckers. I'm gonna go back you're through cheaters. And if I see Chris's name hashtag, you're off. The you fucking, fucking list. cheaters. I got a shit ton of them. <laughs> a shit ton of them. <laughs> There's some fucking lazy goddamn entries. Dude, what I love about it is like people's creativity around. Like doing, here's the thing, motherfuckers. <laughs> Don't tag me. Let, let me put this shit out there. All you motherfuckers know this is a good giveaway, too. <laughs> I've had so many people are like, this is the dopest giveaway we've seen it's in a long time. It's $300 worth of cigars. Dude, it's way more than yeah. that. It is so much money in cigars. So much. It's easily, it's probably, it's probably, it's probably closer to 500 yeah. It's a fucking ton of money in cigars. Fucking hats. Dude, we're doing another giveaway coming up. If you little motherfuckers start cheating on this shit, I'm going to stop doing them. <laughs> but I do appreciate those who have been honest about the process. And honestly, I can't even be mad at anybody that tags you in because they're like, path of least resistance, bitch. I, I mean, it was a fucked up. <laughs> they're like, I need, I need another person. Chris, you're it. <laughs> I was like, why am I getting so much tags in these fucking posts? <laughs> it's actually really funny. Very, very clever. I like people's. I like how people work harder to get around something. It's like, you could literally tag anyone. It doesn't to be Chris. <laughs> It is pretty funny to me, but it is a fucking dope giveaway. I'm really excited to do it for everybody. I've been wanting to do like a big giveaway for a while. And we've got another one that's really going to be right around the corner. That's going to be equally as good, if not better. So I'm really, really, really fucking stoked about this giveaway. Uh, I'll be announcing the winner on Saturday. So it's there's a day left. I mean, there's like literally one day and a couple hours left for you. You're fucked. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're listening to this right now, it's already over. It's over. Uh, but it is Thursday that we're recording this previous to the to the giveaway announcement. But yeah, it's been fucking awesome. I really appreciate everybody, dude. It's so it's so cool to see like everybody just kind of like get into it, and it's it's just fun, man. Especially there's just a week that's been just kind of a fucking weird week. Yeah, it's just been that's been kind of a fun ancillary thing that I've gotten to do. Um, that being said, so we'll get back to the the topic at hand. I guess the last question that I have, and Chris, I want your opinion on this, is that if not, because we've really built a big portion of our listenership around Instagram and our influence on Instagram. Majority of it. In our posts, right? And and then once, then it becomes kind of like this self-contained thing. And then people are, you know, telling their friends about it. And we've gotten a lot of relationship as a result of that. Um, But Instagram has been a, a really integral part of how we've been able to grow what we do at the podcast. So if not this and not TikTok and not another social media platform, maybe it is another social media platform. What is it? Like how do, how does a company, how do we as a podcast organization and how does, let's say, a manufacturer, a brand mm-hmm. who is only on Instagram, which there's a lot, mm-hmm. by the way, like the crown heads of the world aren't on TikTok. Mm-hmm. Foundations are not on TikTok. Fucking Tatawai is not on TikTok. How do they continue growing their brand outside of just, hey, here's my brick and mortar initiative. When we know that social media marketing is highly effective. I would say this, and this is from a consumer perspective. If you truly feel the, uh, you feel compelled to be engaged in the cigar industry, it is important that you seek ways in order to engage it that are outside of general social media. Now, if you expect that you're just going to be relatively superficial with engagement in, in, in with the cigar industry things like instagram that's okay tiktok 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 tip top tiktok <laughs> is i think also very superficial even though there's cigar right. brands on there is a very superficial way of consuming cigar information and content sure. if you truly want to be engaged there are definitely outlets to do so that are outside of the social media norm. You just need to be smart enough and ask questions in order to join those types of communities. Because I feel like the cigar community as a whole will no longer probably be a public entity. It is going to be a private. It's going to be a private organization of people that are closed off to only cigar people 
So the idea of social media being a very public thing where we hoped that there would be no censorship, that we can reach masses of people, whether or not they were into our content or not, or right, or they're or into interested cigars or intrigued, or, not. or like, hey, I want to get into this thing. And if you want to be into cigars, I feel like it's going to go to more of a private place. And I think we're starting to do that, like what we're doing with Discord. You know, I think we'll see the same thing happen across many different brands in the cigar industry. But if you truly want to be engaged, that's probably going to be the more formal way of doing it right? versus straight up public social media. I think that's not going to be the avenue for you to engage in the cigar community. I feel like that's going to slowly die and there's probably nothing we can do about it. But there are ways to be engaged with that content in other forms, whether it be a Discord or a private channel or something right. like that. I, I can see unless a social media platform is built that is intentionally open. And what I mean is like open as far as like non filter that, that, that any content goes, the freedom of speech um, aspect to that is anything and all goes within reason. Right. right? Um, but certainly not stifling premium tobacco. I could see a creation of a new platform. I do agree with you as far as Discord. Discord is a very intimate community of people who interrelate to one another on a daily basis. I think mm -hmm. Discord is really powerful when you're trying to build a solid community of folks who uh, admire uh, things similar to you, which obviously Discord isn't just specifically around cigars, obviously. Start with gaming. Start with gaming, right? Yeah. And it's still, I think gaming is probably still number one for Discord. Um, but in terms of cigar community, it's been very powerful. Like, we have a tight knit group, but everybody interacts all day long. Like the interaction never ends. I can't keep up. It goes all fucking yeah. day. And we don't even have, like, I haven't even pushed it that hard. And, and part of my fear is I don't want too many people to where that intimate connection that you're creating or that dialogue that you're creating ends up just becoming noise. But I think discord is really powerful. I think the other thing, um, that is, uh, to be utilized, um, by more folks, which is not like, I'll use a cigar influence, for instance, and I'll just use somebody female um, and not because the International Women's Day was yesterday, but just because, right? Um, let's say you are somebody who is a cigar influencer and the basis of what you do is uh, photos or images around you smoking a cigar. It's your personal profile with you smoking cigars. Um, that in and of itself through Instagram is a very powerful thing, especially if you are someone who I think most people in the cigar world deem you to be very attractive. There's some power behind that. There's things and opportunities that open up themselves to you. I think the other thing that shouldn't be missed and uh, should be considered when you're trying to build a brand is a website. It's mm -hmm. like having a place that's yours that you can expose what you have either from product or maybe it's knowledge base or whatever it may be that is searchable, that is something that isn't, because right now, as far as I know, you can still go onto Google and search for cigars and everything pops up. <laughs> yeah. Until they say no, everything is open and available for you through Google search. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is how we get people who find our podcast is just through Googling. You Google cigar podcast, we're one of the results that shows up. Mm -hmm. And so I can see I can see Google search um, analytics and statistics that say, okay, someone found you through a Google search. Yeah. So you also have that ability as well. I do agree with Chris in terms of that community comes more private because it's your brand and it's you. It's not this open platform that exists. Um, but I think if we're going to survive or even thrive and grow as an industry, we're going to have to get creative on how to get out of these normal social media platforms. Dude, and it, it, and it starts with what happened with the cigar industry when they put the ban on advertising. What did fucking the cigar industry do? It started reaching peers directly. It started posting its own content in social media and reaching consumers directly that can interact with the brand. And it started with Facebook. All right. right. Yeah. Facebook, with Facebook. Facebook blogs and Reddit were like the big ones. Where groups, where brands were creating groups and consumers can engage with those brands in groups. With the cigar industry, it was even more of a restriction because you could no longer advertise cigars or tobacco products on websites, right. which is the primary way we consumed content back in the day before social media. But social media didn't have restrictions on that at the time. 
Right. They didn't stifle it. They didn't hide it. They didn't shadow ban it. So we used social media as a means to connect with the consumer in a way that wasn't advertising, but was a way to reach the consumer to say, hey, I've got a brand. I've got a product. Right. You might be interested. Do you want to be part of my community? Right. And that's how I did. Well, now social media is completely shutting that down. <laughs> right. Sounds like I got to revert back to old ways a little bit. But what the cigar community did at the forefront of av- tobacco products no longer being advertised is we did it through social media. It was peer-to-peer influence. So I feel like even with social media now really hindering our ability to have peer-to-peer influence, you still can't actually get rid of the peer-to-peer influence. Think about yeah. it. We might have been using social media as a tool to do peer and peer influence. Hey, I'm going to tag you on this post. Like, I saw this fucking cigar. I know you'd fucking love it. I'm going right. to tag you in it. Right. Right. That's starting to be restricted. I get it. Right. That was the, the cigar industry did guerrilla marketing in its purest form with peer to peer influencing outside of the regulations of advertising tobacco products by just. Engaging the consumer directly <laughs> right. on social media. Now that that's being stifled, the ability to do guerrilla type marketing, such as peer to peer influence, still is effective even in private communities. So, if we want to grow the industry, if we want to grow the cigar industry, knowing the restrictions that we're facing with social media, it can still fucking be done through private channels. Right. So, if you are a part of a group, a private group. Maybe it's our Discord. Maybe it's another one. You can still tag friends and introduce other friends to those communities that are private. Right. And you could still grow the community privately, if that makes sense. Makes sense. You know? Yeah. I do know, and I agree with you, um, it's just weird how everything kind of flipped on its head. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like Now you're in a reversion back to something that is more private than open forum mm-hmm. public. Unless, again, there is a hero that comes to us that says, we're opening up this social media platform that every, everybody will be on, which other people have tried to attack Instagram in that regard and been extremely unsuccessful in doing so. I remember some of them. <laughs> Vero is the one that I think of. <laughs> I think of a, a couple. I was like, Vero literally just did Instagram, but did it way worse. It was way um, worse. <laughs> so I, I think that if... We have a hero that comes along that is more mindful of let's make sure we don't hinder people's ability to show content within reason. And right. I don't and and this this is a disparity that exists. You don't want porn, right? Right. On a public social media platform. You know, Twitter I think is the only one that you can really still post obscene shit on. Yeah. Unless you're a subscription to like OnlyFans, which is not public, that's private. We got a couple accounts. Um, <laughs> so you, so you have that, yeah. um, you've of course got racism, foul language, you, you have any sort of discriminatory or discrimination posts obviously have to be hindered and that all can be monitored and that can all be filtered, yeah. but down to like things like cigars or even cigarette smoking or vaping and all those things. And why not start a social media platform that does have stringent rules on age verification? Yeah, you know, what I mean, if we want to show cigars and we want to show smoking, make the legal, legal the, age limit. Yeah, the only thing that should ever be in consideration for not pushing that content is because of viewership of of children. If that doesn't exist, it shouldn't be a problem. Right. Because when I smoke a cigar, it doesn't affect anyone else but me. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like it doesn't do any. And by the way, I don't know of any children that are watching me smoke a cigar going, "I want to be that guy." No. I don't know this ever happened. Listen, my son has seen me smoke a cigar and I don't do it around him and I do it outside. And even he's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's pretty adamant he's about like, it. He's like, let's play Zelda. I'm like, well. Yeah. yeah he's pretty adamant about it for sure. Um, anyway, so there answers uh, the potential um, the potential for something that could come in or going back to more private communities and channels. Because I do feel like over time, the main and large social media platforms are going to continue doing this. I'm just telling everybody to be prepared because it's happening to us currently and it's happening to people I know with very large followings. Yeah. Um, it is, it's, it's being stifled. It's being hindered. There's a barrier. There's a block. 
content's not being pushed. You're probably not seeing nearly as much of my stuff as, as you were in the past. Um, and that's exactly what's happening. So be prepared for it. It's all trickle down effect. It's going to make its way down where the content's not going to be available for anyone <laughs> at some point, unless somebody is immediately following you. Um, so we got to look for other avenues to stay connected as a community. And that's the most important part is making sure that we keep the community connection alive. Mm -hmm. And we could do that through other channels. I agree with Chris. We could do that through live events too. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of ways that we can do that where we can continue this thing on. Um, but I think we shouldn't all be relying specifically on social media to broadcast the content that we want to push. We need to be creative on looking for other avenues. Yeah. And I think it's still stuck in my head, but you're like when a hero comes along and you know, in my head that song popped up you know when a hero comes along oh yeah i love that song with strength to carry on yeah dude like i just you know there's someone out there like our robin hood you know hopefully yeah and i feel like they're there i think they'll come soon come, <coughs> come rescue us yeah we need that for sure come rescue us um all right, I will say this. Let's conclude this episode. Uh, it's been another one that's partially serious. Got to get out of serious ones. No, but you know. We need a really funny one next time. Yeah, but I mean, there was some jokes. There was some fun racial <sighs> things that maybe make people like, I'm unfollowing. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> they're cringing. <laughs> they're cringing at the beginning that's of the episode. That's okay. But, you know, yeah. there was there was more than last episode. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> last episode was pretty serious. Uh, which, by the way, you can catch that episode, episode 233. It is out there, YouTube, um, pretty much all podcast platforms. Um, I also say this because we've already mentioned it. Uh, if you guys want to be a part of something more meaningful, you want to be a part of a connected community, you can join our Discord. It's a wonderful chat group with some people who know more about cigars than I'll ever forget. Um, we do have, uh, we do have, uh, Rich in there who has been in charge of providing us cigar history. Uh, and some of the stuff is not only super fucking interesting. Um, and some of them are like really long articles. I went through like a fucking 40 page PDF last night. Rich is like, you got to read this. It's about Ohio agriculture. Dude, and I'm like, oh my Rich, God. And I'm like going through this. It's like written in the fucking night, early 1900s. I'm like, oh my God. Like, Rich is great because, like, it's he's a kind of a troll on your attention span because he'll post one thing in there and you're like, oh, that's an interesting fact, and then it's followed an up by like ten other fucking things that are relative to that. I'm like, holy yeah. shit, I can't keep up. Yeah, Rich is a cigar historian <laughs> through and through. Um, but he he always posts some really good content. Uh, Rich, who we got as a moderator, who's kind of going through and making sure that everything is organized the way that it's supposed to be organized. And we've got a lot of people. We do brand of the week, so we'll uh, we'll highlight a brand of the week, and we'll just topically talk about that brand. Like, hey, what do we like? What do we don't like? Post pictures of cigars. What do we think about this brand overall? Where's their significance in the marketplace? We do hot topics, which that seems to be the one that gets probably the most attention. And I think a lot of it is around the Pravada stuff and, and the half wheel stuff. There's a channel if you have suggestions for the show. That's yep. also another biggie. Yep, like and we, and we in them. and we release announcements around the show as well. So every Monday, I'll post like here's all the links to the show for people who are interested and want to go through and check those out. Um, and then we also have a promotion spot for you. So as a user who comes in, one of the things that I never wanted to do that most groups do is hinder your guys' ability to promote your own stuff. So like for example, we have a guy in there, Andre, who's from Sweden. He does cigar reviews. He's actually on uh, the cigar review panel for Cigar Journal. And he does some really good comprehensive reviews of cigars. And a lot of them you probably don't smoke because he is from Sweden. So what he has access to is a bit different. Yeah. Um, but his reviews are awesome. And I told him, I was like, dude, promote your stuff on here. So I want people to promote stuff. I want people to exchange like, hey, I've got these cigars for sale. Does someone want to do a trade? Like, I don't want to hinder anybody's ability to go in there. Now, if you're doing some shady shit, I'm going to fucking call you out and I'm just going to boot you from the Discord. But if there's something that you're really promoting or there's cigars you want to get rid of or trade, we're a perfect platform for that. Come in, hang out with us in Discord. If there's something you have to promote, whether it's your own review site or it's your Instagram, whatever it may be, just come in and join us. We're a fucking wonderful community. It's been a lot of fun. I joined a uh, pipe community through our Discord. <laughs> Did you really? Dude, pipes are dope. Yeah. God, I love smoking pipe. I actually may smoke one tonight. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I'm going to smoke something, though. But anyway, we've got to conclude this episode. Thanks for hanging out with us today. We appreciate it, everybody. Uh, listenership, 
I can't thank you guys enough. It's been fucking unreal. The last week has been a uh, drain on my soul in the best way possible. That's all, that's all I can say about it. It's been fucking intense to say the least. Um, but we greatly appreciate it. So we're going to conclude episode 234. We'll be back at you next week with episode 235. See everyone.